Great. Hi, Emily. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm super happy that you were able to make the time to be with us. Uh, you are closing the day. Um, and uh, before you start, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, audience. So you uh, work in interaction fiction, narrative design, and conversation modeling. Um, you were a creative director for three years at Fell Better Games, a British studio that focused on narrative. Uh, you have released over two dozen of solo games, as well as contributing to indie games, and also frequently consult with studios of all sizes. Um, I always love to check your website and blogs for your insights, uh, so I encourage everyone to have a look to Emily Schultz's uh, website for for uh, for that, and your sh your your talk today will um, use the formal constraint of interactive narrative as a prompt or a series of prompts for creative writing on a particular theme. And we are really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And I was privileged to um, hear a little bit of the previous talk, which was quite a lot of fun as well. So I was glad I was good, able to hear that. Um, can everybody, is my, are my slides showing up properly? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as was just introduced, um, I work in several different areas, some of which are much more technical than others. So um, I've been in kind of the artificial intelligence space for many years, sometimes during a period when that was really not anything like what current large language models are doing. So previous to chat GPT and instead focused on what sorts of techniques can we use to create dynamic characters, create dynamic narrative, uh, but with a lot more sort of hand rolling and developer intention. So actually overlapping a little bit with some of the generative techniques that we were just hearing about in the previous talk. Uh, and I've worked on how do we apply that both in small personal games, things that are designed to express very kind of unique perspectives, and also how do we apply some of those same techniques on larger scale games that might be more like what we're seeing in the commercial space, but to tackle some of the problems of uh, making the game really responsive to the player's agency, the player's actions, and giving a richer experience than we could probably provide if we were asking authors to handwrite everything that could possibly happen to the player. Another one of my areas of strong interest is gameplay that focuses on social interactions and conversation. And this is partly because uh, I enjoy games, but I'm not particularly good at reflexes. Uh, I'm not good at combat. I'm not good at shooting when those sorts of things are fundamental to the gameplay. Um, I tend to get kind of stuck. Um, and I'm much more interested in kind of questions of how can we bring things that might be in conventional drama or in conventional novels, those kinds of topics about how people relate to one another on a personal level and how do social groups relate to one another on a personal level? How can we bring that into gameplay? How can we speak to that through games as a medium we have this tremendously powerful medium, but it's often not talking about those themes very much. So um, how do we solve some of those design challenges? How do we solve some of the technical challenges? How do we help players even understand kind of that new range of gameplay? So those are the kinds of areas that I tend to be working in professionally. Um, and that is both sort of fueled by and feeding back into work that I do that's just sort of personal expressive pieces of my own things that I want to write that aren't particularly meant for a commercial audience where I just am drawn to explore something that's concerning me or you know something's going on with characters in the world um, and I want to put that out there as though it were my own piece of poetry novel or something like that. Um, so usually when I talk about all of these things, the focus of my talk is really like whatever it is, even if I'm presenting to a very technical audience, if I'm presenting to a sort of broader audience of game students, wherever I am, I tend mostly to be talking about craft and the, how those techniques, how the artificial intelligence, how the procedural generation methods, how the puzzle design, how the sort of social gameplay 
can be used to create a particular experience for the player. So I'm often talking about what are the strategies that we can use to make sure that the player is experiencing a great deal of agency, they feel in, in control of the story, or if they don't feel in control of the story, that's for reasons that are intentional. We're trying to give them a particular experience of how their actions have an impact on the game world. We want to make our gameplay as communicative as possible, all of those kinds of things. So a lot of my talks are about that. This talk, I wanted to take a completely different perspective on what I'm doing with these tools and why I'm drawn to them. And for that matter, why I even find this such a powerful space for personal expressive work, as opposed to just a thing where, you know, it's an area where writing and uh, sort of procedural generation can be combined in interesting ways. Um, and so where that comes into play is around what it actually means, what the sort of creation of these pieces requires from the designer and how I think that can be useful. So one of the things that interests me about any kind of artistic medium that we might wanna be working in, and I realize this is this is very abstract, I'm gonna come down to some sort of specific points in a moment, but at a, at a very high level, one of the things that I find appealing about different artistic medium is not just this is something that lots of people like to play. It's not just this is something that has a broad audience. Those are really interesting points. But I'm also interested in what is it about working in this medium that requires me to make contact with my subject matter, think about my themes, work with what I'm writing, that actually expands my own understanding of it. So that through the process of creating this artwork, I am going to wind up with something that communicates more or is more thorough or is deeper or is more engaged than if I just sort of blurted out at a high level what my personal thoughts on that topic were. So the work of the art is actually kind of holding me accountable. It's making me think about these issues thoroughly. Um, it's making me explore aspects of my theme that I might not even myself as an artist have been aware of before I started working. And this is not something like the capacity of a particular medium to do that is not unique to games. This is not something that only games do. Uh, so I often think about when I was a high school student, one of the things that I enjoyed doing as a hobby was making pencil sketches of flowers and, you know, sort of mushrooms and things I found in the garden. Um, and the reason that I did that was not that I was a great artist. It was definitely not that anybody else in the world particularly wanted to see my pencil sketches of mushrooms like they were not great. Um, but what it made me do was spend a lot of time really noticing every aspect of the thing that I was drawing, because in order to make that kind of specific targeted representation, I had to first really see the thing that I was drawing. Um, so this is this is true of all kinds of different art forms. They require us to observe and think about and understand the thing that we're representing um, with great sort of intent and precision. But I think there are some aspects of interactive design in particular that can do this really powerfully and that I find really useful for my own thinking through the projects. Um, so I wanted to talk through a couple of different examples of um, projects where I feel like that has been an important part of where the project has gone and what has come out of it or places where I felt like that process fell down a little bit and how I think through this stuff. Um, so the first one that I was going to, to talk about, this is probably the least game-like of anything that I'm that I'm gonna talk about today, um, is a very personal piece about translating four lines of Homer. There's a particular passage of the Odyssey where um, Odysseus, if you, if you know the epic, has just come back to his home. He's found that uh, his
system of the Cyclops in order to be able to get through this challenge as well. And it's a very powerful piece of poetry. It's something that um, a lot of people through the ages have sort of retranslated or referenced in their own work or sort of drawn attention back to. Um, but what I wanted to do with it was actually do a piece that spoke about the experience of contacting an ancient work of this much power. So it was, here is something, a piece of text that I find personally very meaningful that I have gone back to, um, you know, both as a student, I was a classic student when I was younger. So that's kind of why I ran into this to start with, but I have the experience of, of actually translating it from the original Greek, but also kind of the experience of going back to it over and over in my own thinking as a sort of personal touchstone or as something that I wanted to draw on for other work. Um, and so the question was like, how do I make an interactive experience that speaks to that spectrum of different things that translation can be to us, ways of engaging with a piece of text um, that range from I'm having an experience that feels like being a student where I'm just trying to figure out what this text even means um, to things where I might be bringing a little bit more context to it, things where I might be choosing to put my own spin on the work, depending on kind of how I was making contact with it. All of those kinds of things. So what I did was I made, this is still a very text-based uh, kind of experience, but I made a piece in uh, a game development tool called Texture, which allows you to put some text on the screen, put some player verbs or interactions at the bottom of the screen, and then the player can actually um, drag some of those uh, verbs into place uh, in order to see the text actually change. And I'm going to pause for just a second here so that I can actually put up a live version of this and show it to you because that's actually tends to be much clearer than just showing individual screenshots. Um, so bear with me for one second. Um, so this is what this actually looks like in practice. Um, and we have some of this original Greek text, but as the player chooses some of these options and drags them around, um, we can see the text lights up where we might be able to select it. Um, and we've got these options about how are we going to try to understand this. Um, so part of what I was expecting the player experience to be, especially somebody who you know, does not in fact know any Greek, is that they would look at this and think, okay, I, none of this makes any sense, but I've got to pick what you know some portion of this that i'm going to translate first i'm going to drag you know choose to drag one of these verbs over um maybe this one looks interesting and we see it then transfer into english and as we engage with the text um we can make sort of decisions about like maybe i just want to have a very literal translation and go through each of these things um and translate it um that way or maybe I want to translate these things in a way that would actually be a little bit silly or a little bit lighter. So all of these things kind of allow the player to engage with their own idea of like which bits of the text are attracting my interest. How do I want to try to understand that? How does my understanding of this text even just change based on the order in which I'm doing this? Because you can replay this over and over. Um, and the actual text of the translation changes a little bit depending on um, what you've selected previously as well. Um, so all of that allows for, uh, going back to my main slides here, um, it allows for sort of a an experience of this translation that tries to capture some of the confusion and ambiguity that you have as a very junior kind of student of Greek, like first encountering this stuff, you recognize certain words first and all this kind of stuff, but then building up a level of intentionality about um, how you're portraying it. Um, and you can see, you know, if I if we kind of work through a number of these uh, translations in sequence, um, sometimes like if I decided I'm going to do lots of sort of put in context actions, for instance, I'm going to see lots of really specific detail about the text that might actually be kind of overwhelming from the point of view of just understanding the story, right? Like you're sort of cluttering your entire um, translation with lots of glosses, lots of grammatical explanations, lots of sort of contextual footnotes and stuff like that. Um, or you can wind up with something that's much more streamlined. Um, but all of this process really spoke to what questions, you know, this sort of like using this framework 
to dig deeper into my theme. What are the questions that I want to ask about this subject, about translation, and how can I let the player drive and interact with those questions? So the set of verbs that I decided on at the beginning of developing this project, you know, I want to give the player the option to translate freely. I want to give them the option to read something very literally. I, you know, I was sort of selecting these different approaches. Um, and when I did that, I was committing myself in the same way that I would be committing myself if I was sort of sitting down to, to make a pencil sketch of an unusual fungus. Like I'm committing myself to come up with an answer for every single combination in that text. There's nothing here that is not written by human hands, all of the different ways that those phrases can be interpreted or interpreted in context with one another, all of that is the result of my actually sitting there thinking and writing out what those things should be. And so it forces this kind of specificity that I think is really, really useful when we're trying to engage thematically with things, because I think in some other contexts, we're drawn towards relying very heavily on examples. Like if I am, you know, even in this talk, I'm using a lot of examples because I cannot possibly take you through the entire set of things that I've done. So, you know, we have to go selectively. Um, similarly, you know, if I'm writing an essay, if I'm talking to a friend, if I'm kind of making rhetorical points, I'm often, you know, if I'm writing a piece of poetry, I'm often drawing on sort of high level evocative ideas that might actually be very cherry picked. They might be leaving out lots of information, lots of important edge cases. And there's something about the interactive process and the process of really designing intentionally to explore your theme thoroughly that doesn't let you off the hook in that way. It really makes you just, you know, sit there and go through all of those things. And sometimes you can wind up um, kind of doing this in a way that winds up being a little bit less than satisfying. So sort of the second thing that I wanted to talk about here was um, a project I did called Restless, which is a ghost story. Um, it's built in a very different tool from Texture, much more technically complex. This was built on a piece of technology called Character Engine, which is about sort of simulating non-player character dialogue and even being able to, to kind of recombine their dialogue text much more dynamically. So using a lot more procedural generation tools for this. Um, and the way that this works is that you as the player are playing as a ghost who is haunting a house and the inhabitants of the house are sick of hearing you whine and wail in the middle of the night and they confront you about this and initially your only options are sort of to make different noises but you're allowed to select the emotionality that you want to express um, through those noises and as the game goes on um, you are sort of selecting these emotional options and those are actually changing what your list of dialogue options are so you can interact differently depending on kind of how you're remixing your self-expression um as the game goes on this gets your sort of palette of things that you can say gets more complex because the person who's talking to you understands you better and sort of assists you to power up you have more and more options of emotionally here's what i want to express and even topically, here's what I want to talk about. So you you go from only having these kind of noises that you can make to being able to communicate in speech and being able to communicate, in fact, with sort of remixed speech that expresses different um, ideas, different tones. And you can even kind of combine multiple moods at the same time in a single line of dialogue. So this is part of what Character Engine was doing under the surface was providing all of that remixing. Um, so... That's another case where I was really committing myself to like, let's talk through all of these possible things that the character, the player character of the ghost could be feeling and require ourselves to think about like, what do those combinations mean? What are they expressing? Even if the engine is dynamically letting me combine some of those emotions in the dialogue text, I, as the author of this work, still need to be thinking about how is the non-player character going to be responding to that kind of input? How is this story going to flow as a result? And all of those kinds of things. Um, and what I found was this was, you know, sort of partially successful and partially not. This was a project that I wrote in a very constrained time period. So probably if I had spent more, had more time available to work on it, I would have actually wound up cutting the project down a little bit again. Because one of the things that I often find in this process is 
I come up with sort of a palette of things that I want to think about, verbs I want to use, you know, sort of writing commitments that I want to make um, to my writing process. And what I find is that like some of those prompts um, and some of those verbs turn out to be much less revealing um, than some of the other ones. So, you know, is it really interesting to have sort of all of the emotional variants that we've committed to here, this sort of openness, sadness, anger, curiosity, amusement, et cetera, like, are those all really doing enough work or could we streamline that a little bit? Um, could we, and this, this sort of actually interestingly overlaps with the previous talk of, of, you know, sometimes what you want to do is think about that really complex generative space and the full range of developer thinking that you're bringing to bear on it, but then actually decide, no, actually I'm going to, um, I'm going to select a smaller space of the generated material to actually show to the player because that is going to be a more distinctive and more interesting um, experience. Uh, and then the final piece that I wanted to talk about is the project that I just did at Fail Better Games. Um, this is obviously is a commercial game. It is a dating sim and murder mystery that is set in fallen London, which is Fail Better's uh, kind of main IP. Um, and it concerns sort of Victorian characters. I'm not going to give sort of the full background of this for time, but it concerns Victorian characters who are falling in love, dating, talking about various um, things that are going on, and then somebody gets killed, and the player has the opportunity to try and figure out what's going on there. And in order to kind of enable the richness of player exploration that I wanted to offer, we actually have as one of the sort of significant features of this game, the opportunity to build your own murder board, right? Like you've got that kind of, I'm a detective, I'm making a wall covered with all of the people and the connections that I think have to do with this. And the player, as they're going through, can say, okay, I think that the murder method was this. I think the person who did the murder was that. I think somebody else was also an accomplice or behind the scenes on it. I think it's this person. And you're kind of filling in these elements as you play based on evidence that you've discovered. And you can actually make up you know, a range of very different explanations or ideas about what's happening. Sometimes you're building kind of questions. Um, sometimes you're building actual sort of fully fledged answers uh, to thinking about what's going on. And then you can take those back to other characters and talk to those characters about what's happening. Um, so there's a lot going on here kind of, a, again, on a procedural level, because the text that is on the side of the screen sort of describing what the, the generator thinks the player is expressing um, is itself like generating all of that text based on kind of the tokens that the player has put on the left side of the screen. Um, so there is a kind of requirement for me as an author to think through all of those possibilities. But even more than that, what this game required me to do was think about the, those same kinds of structural commitments that I was just talking about, but applied at the level of plot rather than the level of kind of moment to moment verb gameplay. Because if I'm offering the player the opportunity to imagine many different solutions to this mystery um, and identify sort of specific solutions that feel like they're best supported by the rest of the gameplay, that requires me as a creator to conceptualize, okay, you know, like most of these are in fact incorrect, right? But how are the other non-player characters going to respond to that? How is setting up an incorrect read of the mystery going to affect your relationships with other characters? How is it going to be handled? Like, are there some false but interesting claims that you can make that can lead the plot to go in a new direction? And all of those really made me think about the characters, how they were interacting, how they were interacting with the in-game justice system, all of those kinds of elements at a level of specificity and thoroughness that I would not have needed to do otherwise if I had just been writing this as a novel or even if I had been writing it as a more conventional branching narrative. Um, and then the kind of the final piece of all of that is when you are using this kind of technique to build out um, something that is very systemic when you're as a creator making a, a system of gameplay mechanics to express something about the world as you understand it, um, then in the process of QAing your project, you can even kind of encounter things where you realize, hey, my understanding as a developer is inadequate, right? Like interacting with this system has forced me to recognize that there are places where you know, edge cases in my mental model or whatever, where it feels like what I'm getting out of this is actually not true about the world, or it's actually not sensical, doesn't work. Um, and therefore, I need to refine my own understanding in order to make this more truthful. What does that tell me? 
Um, so I will stop there um, if, if there's time for questions. Um, but thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Emily. Um, any questions for Emily in the audience? Or are we reaching out the end of the day and everyone is? <laughs> no, yeah. Hi, thank you, Emily, for the, this lovely talk. Um, I had a question in the back of my, of my mind mm -hmm. when you presented all these examples, uh, the one about translating Homer, um, and even the, um, the the examples, the original examples of like drawing the mushrooms, uh, mask of the rose, and the ghost thing, they all seem to also have like a theme of revealing a mystery, a mystery, kind of mm -hmm. like like it also like reflected in the in the method you described. Like you want to study the mushroom, so you consider the mushroom to be an unknown quantity, and then you study this unknown quantity, you solve the mystery of the mushroom. How does it work? Where are the Pollens and stuff. Sorry, I don't know much about mushrooms. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, like, do you think there's like um, like the presence of mystery in in this kind of works that you described? Is it like embedded? Is it like fundamental? What uh, I'd love to to know. Mm. What do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it has to be. Um, I think I am drawn to uh, creating gameplay experiences for the player where exploration is a big part of what the player does. Right. Like, and partly that's because like, I tend to enjoy that myself. Like I often will enjoy well-made puzzle games or things where there are sort of subtleties about, uh, character motivations that I can learn through the course of play. Like those are the sorts of things that I tend to be drawn to as an experience. So I, you know, I'm probably more likely to write that sort of thing as well. Um, but I think, I think that, like the approach doesn't necessarily have to be one where we're exploring an unknown fixed object. Um, I think it can also be, I, I just off the top of my head, I mean, I, I think it can also be one where um, we're uh, trying to map something that we actually think we understand pretty well. So I've done, as I say, a lot of work on um, modeling social interaction at, in, in various ways and various levels. And, and often kind of as a developer, you think like I'm, what I'm building here is basically the equivalent of a really sort of simple physics system in that, like I'm, I'm teaching the machine really one oh one level things about how people interact. Um, in practice, like it usually turns out to be a lot more complicated than that. Um, but I think, you know, even, even in cases where you think you're not, um, you're not trying to find something out that you don't already know, like there's still that kind of, um, opportunity to, to just test for robustness, I guess, what your concept is. Does that make sense? Sorry if your mic had to be handed back to me. Uh, <laughs> sure, yes. sorry, sorry. <laughs> that does make a lot of sense. Thank you so much. And I think uh, it resonates a lot with, um, uh, I don't know, a bit of self-promo, but like the work we do with neurocracy a lot, like this tension of like exploring the, the form of the content, as you said, and what it brings mm -hmm. us to, to us as like, we tended to think about the world as an encyclopedia afterwards. Of like, hey, if I had to describe this person, I want to describe their biography, what they did, but also mm -hmm. the, the see also section is important for this person, right? Like it's uh, all of these things. It was fascinating. Thank you so much, Emily. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's a, that is a really interesting project. And, it, and that kind of like, you've made a really strong formal choice that affects what you wind up writing in it. So, yeah. And then we have a, a second question here. Hi, Emily. Um, so I have a question. Um, in order to uh, function best as, say, na uh, in your case, a narrative designer, and in my case, I hope to be a game designer eventually, um, mm -hmm. in order to flourish best as a designer, do you uh, consider it to be more important to uh, draw from personal experience or look outward into the world to, say, express best or exp uh, express most productively, per se? Um, I mean, are, are those, I, I'm not sure those are actually mutually contradictory. Um, but I mean, I, so certainly there are kind of ends of a spectrum where there are certain things I could be writing where I really have no personal experience at all, right? Like anything where I might be contributing to something in the, like the first person shooter zone, or, you know, it's like, there are lots of, 
you know, combat elements. That's not an experience that I've ever had in my life. I, you know, to the extent that I was trying to make that realistic, I would have to base it on a great deal of research. Um, and on the other hand, there are things, you know, like this sort of translation piece where uh, like it's drawing very, very strongly on just like, you know, something that I've spent many, many hours of my life doing. And I didn't really need to go anywhere to look for it. But I think there are lots of sort of things in the middle where you're drawing on your own experience, but they're, but your own experience is like necessarily com incomplete, right? Like you, you don't have kind of a full knowledge of what everybody in a particular situation might experience. And you might have committed to some formal constraints for your design that require you to imagine counterfactuals that you did not experience in your own life. So then there's the kind of that, that synthesis of here's the stuff that I'm bringing to this, but I'm also going to read up some other things or whatever. Um, in terms of like what what actually helps people flourish, like people are different. So I don't actually know like what everybody would say about this. Um, but for myself, uh, I I really enjoy research. I really enjoy going out and finding out about people's experiences with things and also just engaging with like how are other people even trying to do this kind of artwork like I'm really interested in sort of edge experimentation by other designers so that I can understand you know what what possible perspectives are there on this that I haven't thought of myself and a lot of the ideas that I've been most excited about developing are partially riffs on other people's work right so like maybe that means I'm just like not as you know, sort of singly generative and, you know, in, in my thinking is as some people, but, um, but I think, you know, as humans, there's a lot of delight and value in seeing something somebody else has done saying like, Oh my God, that really speaks to me, except like if it had been me, I would have done it this way. And then like kind of running off in that direction. Um, so I really don't see it as kind of an either or. Great. Well, yeah. Oh, one more question. Yes. Uh, hello, Emily. I have one question uh, regarding AI. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, um, do you plan with your company and uh, your own projects to um, implement AI? And if you implement it, uh, is it going to be in the game or is it going to be a dialogue through APIs with LLMs? Right. Okay. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not currently sort of working with just one company. Um, I've left fail better and I'm doing some, um, consulting in different spaces. So it's not, there's not kind of a, um, a single point of contact between me and these questions. Um, it's really interesting to me how this dialogue has hugely shifted since LLMs came about as well, because almost everything that I was doing that I would have described as AI up until about 2018 or so um, now is not the same thing at all as what people tend to mean when they're talking about AI, which now people like very often just mean deep learning models. Um, so, you know, it, it's like there's a lot of that, the kind of older techniques that I'm still really interested in and still using kind of like some procedural generative techniques, techniques for um, having NPC agents who make decisions on their own. And that's not that's not based on a black box. It's not based on a training model that is pulling in lots of potentially copyrighted material. It's not really replacing anybody else's work. So a lot of the things that people have kind of identified as potential challenges about deep learning model application don't come into play there. Um, the questions about like, how do we, or how should we apply uh, the sort of, more ambitious, like current generation LLMs in games like that I, is it, it's very complicated. And I find myself um, having lots and lots of really interesting and different conversations with different clients about different use cases. Um, so I, I, I like this is I, I, it could be an entire talk of its own, what I even think are the pros and cons around this, because I think there are, you know, many people have identified a bunch of social issues around the rapid development of these models. So do we really even want to lean into that? Do we want to encourage that? Do we want to try and slow it down until we understand better, like economically, how the introduction of this kind of AI is likely to impact society and employment, all those kinds of things. Like, I think that is a very valid 
um, excuse me, a very valid set of concerns and a really good thing to think set of things to think about. Um, and I think it can't only be addressed from within the game space either. I think it's something where, you know, if we have strong views on that, that should affect our professional practice, but it should also affect, um, you know, what sort of activism and legal engagement and, uh, you know, kind of if we're voting, if we're citizens of democracies that regulate these things, like, you know, do we want to engage with our democracies that way? So there's like, there's a, you know, this, this goes well beyond kind of a design question. Um, at the same time, there are certain very specific applications of some of these tools that I do find exciting and that I am hopeful about and that I'm hopeful we can find a way to apply without running afoul of some of those other issues. And I haven't even touched on the, the sort of ecological issue that is very carbon intensive to even train these bottles, which again is like a non-trivial issue. Um, but you know, where I, where I see them being appealing and interesting from a design perspective is where it feels like they're not supplanting a creator um, and not replacing somebody's creative capabilities, but where they're um, allowing people to express things that previously would have just been too hard or too much work, right? So I don't, at least with the current crop of things, I've played a bunch with a bunch of different um, large language models. I'm not really convinced that at the moment they do a very good job of writing, you know, non-player character dialogue that feels anything like as good or as interesting or, you know, as, as sort of richly imagined as human written dialogue. And I'm also completely fine with that because I do not want, you know, the game writing community to be supplanted by a bunch of LLMs, right? Like, I think that would be tragic and culturally... Uh, unfortunate. So, uh, you know, but I think there are places where the thing that we're actually designing as an art object is uh, a, like the mechanical system rather than the actual text that's being output. And in that case, sometimes you can use the LLM in a way that is basically kind of, it's like a renderer. It's like the main point is for you to understand everything that's going on under the surface here. And that is where the actual art is. It's like the expression of how people, you know, whatever it is that you've mechanically modeled. And we're just using the LLM to describe that in language because for whatever reason, that is what we want to do in this game. Um, there are some other use cases as well that I'm talking over with some clients I can't really get into because of um, kind of NDA approaches. And again, you know, this is also all within the context of like ethically, how do we deal with this? Um, so that was a very long winded answer. I'm sorry, but like, this is not, this is not a short answer subject, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I think we reached uh, the end of uh, the day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so great to have you. And uh, yeah, I wish you the best for all your project and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Emily. Bye. All right, so this is the end of uh, the day. I really wanted to say thank you to all our speakers, to our audience for your questions. Uh, you can find, if you want drinks, there are some drinks, if you want to stay a little bit uh, with some snacks and all that for aperitif. Uh, but I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Fondation Adler for their, um, their uh, uh, well support to helping us put this day together. And all my colleagues, Delphi, Nantony, Vitas, uh, Fred, Douglas, uh, Dimitri, <laughs> and I feel I'm, I'm forgetting Amandi, uh, Amandine as well and Sabine were really important to help you put this uh, day together. Yeah, so I hope you find it interesting and then uh, I wish you the best for the rest of the day. Thank you.